Okay, I'm here with Kevin Carson, author and political theorist, uh, talking about his life and intellectual background. Kevin has written four books over the last decade, and they touch on a wide array of political viewpoints. Carson has written in depth using arguments from the Austrian School of Economics, Marxism, Georgism, various strains of anarchism, classical political economists like Locke and Ricardo, and even contemporary policy scholars like Ostrom, Eleanor Ostrom and uh, Vincent Ostrom. Uh, Kevin has played an integral role in the revival of mutualism and individuals of individualism anarchism in the past decade or so. So, Kevin, I am curious as to how you got interested in political theory. Can you talk about how, growing up, you first got interested in political theory? Hmm. Uh, like, well, were your parents I read a lot. particularly political? Pardon? Yeah. I said, were your parents political? Well, my dad, uh, my mom and dad both uh, grew up in the Depression and, uh, you know, Depression, Arkansas, and and dropped out of school in uh, eighth grade. My dad was uh, self-taught and uh, did a lot of reading and passed that on to me. Uh, I started reading about uh politics uh i guess in the 8th grade and and got interested in mm. in it uh majored in poli sci and, and history in college right. so and, growing up what type of politics were you into oh god it, uh, i i went through a lot of uh phases let's put it that way uh I guess uh, I'll just concentrate on the trajectory that led me to where I am now, and that started probably in the early to mid-90s when I was uh, around 30, uh, in my early 30s. um, I uh, really got into traditionalist conservatism of the Russell Kirk uh, variety, <clears throat> and uh, particularly, uh, I got into what Emmy Bradford called the Jeffersonian conservative tradition, uh, localist, rural, and economic populist to some extent, uh, resembled, uh, was also influenced by distributist ideas on property in a lot of ways, uh, Southern agrarian movement. And just given that predilection uh, towards um, small-scale localism, decentralism, and so forth, I, uh, when, I, when I came across a, a copy of Human Scale by Kirkpatrick Sale, it was a, an old used copy at my sister's house. Uh, I, I, I grabbed that and, and devoured it. I, that would have been in 1998, I think. And uh, oh, wow. after reading that, <clears throat> I dug through the footnotes and uh, followed all the the references that looked like they were promising. I started doing a lot of research on economics and uh, the ways that big businesses depended on subsidies from the state, a lot of research on economies of scale and how they're artificially inflated and so forth. Um, And that gradually led me to more be, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, led me to becoming more curious about anarchism and reading up on the various kinds of anarchism. And I'd say sometime late 1999, I started using the label anarchist, uh, joined the Wobblies, and pretty much uh, sh- started shifting radically to the left. So before yeah, that, you were mainly like a libertarian, right type of person? Not really uh, 
uh, at, at my worst, I wasn't libertarian. I was much more uh, traditionalist uh, and uh, culturally conservative. I had some opinions I would uh, really cringe to hear from my younger self now, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> we all would when I. Uh, when I started shifting leftward uh, and uh, adopted the anarchist label, I did a lot of reading on anarchism, and uh, that led me to uh, work on uh, work about Tucker and the Boston anarchists. And I, I read uh, his instead of a book, and thought well, that, yeah. that pretty much describes. Uh, the views I've come to more than anything, especially given my uh, views on the role of the state in, in capitalism. Was that yeah, your from, first inter- – oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, that, and that was, you know, basically it. It was uh, I, I, something clicked with me from <clears> – in <throat> reading Tucker, and, I mean, I've uh, evolved some quite a bit since – then uh it was after that that i you know several years after that i encountered uh more you know high tech focused stuff like peer production uh ostrom's thought on the commons uh eventually started calling myself an anarchist without adjectives right uh so was Benjamin Tucker like your first introduction into anarchism or was there other thinkers like Chomsky or you know more notable anarchist thinkers that first well you know, I, yeah I did a lot a lot of you know pretty well wide ranging uh, survey reading general histories of anarchism I read the uh, anarchist uh, FAQ a bunch of stuff like oh, yeah. like that and uh, I guess in early two thousand I it was when I started intensively reading Chomsky probably about the same time I discovered Tucker's work uh, and Chomsky's stuff on foreign policy had a huge radicalizing effect on me. So, yeah. So and once you read Tucker, I mean, Tucker is like not the most well-known anarchist in the tradition. Uh, were, were there other people that were around your time who were saying, oh, Benjamin Tucker, you know, you got to read Benjamin Tucker, or were you kind of the first one to dust him off? To be honest, I'm, I'm kind of vague on that. Uh, I know uh, there were references to him uh, in the FAQ. Um, mm. I had uh, friends from uh, Konkin's uh, Left Libertarian group, uh, which was more or less left Rothbardian. Although I never, you know, specifically identified with Austrianism or or that tradition, um, I met Roderick Long there. I uh, yeah. also encountered uh, Larry Gamboni of uh, the Red Lion Press and Voluntary Cooperation Movement, uh, and they were pretty heavily uh, promoting Proudhonian. Mutualism. Um, so those were all all currents that, uh, in their own way, made me more aware of Tucker as well. At that time, I mean, it must have been very small, I would imagine, the mutualist tradition. And I mean, and now, I mean, you at least I see it more and more out there. Would you agree that mutualism has grown considerably as like a revival in the past ten years or so? I would I would say so. Uh, I think uh, Sean Wilbur in particular has done a yeah, lot to okay. promote it. Yeah, so I saw that you and Sean Wilbur kind of like go back pretty far. Like in a lot of your articles, you mention him and stuff. What is your relationship with Sean Wilbur? Like, how did that start? I think I think it was um, an anarchist Yahoo group uh, I joined. In. <laughs> 2001, 2002, and wow. he posted there quite a bit. Yeah, he's really active on the Internet. 
I mean, he's, he's, yeah, I mean, he's done a lot of stuff. So, so was, was the internet instrumental in your, you know, getting interested in mutualism and mutualist thought? Oh, hugely. Uh, it was like the uh, summer of 2000. I started playing around with a computer at the VA hospital where I worked uh, when things were slow and just exploring what kind of political stuff and anarchist stuff was on line. Uh, and so then I working bought a desktop in uh, 2000 and late 2001 and signed up with a lot of discussion lists uh, and encountered people from a lot of ideological tendencies and debated with them. I uh, I got into debates uh, critiquing capitalism and promoting the labor theory of value on uh, right libertarian and Austrian economics lists, and I got <coughs> into similar debates uh, promoting markets on anarcho-syndicalist discussion lists, and that did a lot to just hone my ideas and uh, mm. give me more intellectual discipline. But I think being online more than anything, and I, you know, thank whatever gods may be for that, uh, pushed me outside my bubble uh, and got me to. Uh, encounter people unlike myself and uh, right or that I previously say. thought were and, and unlike myself and find out they were actually you know people like me and question my social conservatism so you are from you know kind of a, an odd place a little bit northwest arkansas yeah Is it, are you from springdale arkansas yeah that's where there? i was born yeah uh okay so, lived are there, like the first 20 years of my life there. Are uh, there are many, I, I kind of doubt that there, when you were coming into this tradition, were there others that you were talking with and, you know, face-to-face -face from that area, or was it all kind of over online? It was all pretty much uh, online, uh, her reading uh, periodicals. Hmm. And so this was, how was sometime after okay. I was out of college, too, so... Uh, there was really no direct formative influence uh, from anything I encountered, any groups I encountered in, in college. Do you think growing up in Arkansas impacted your political thought? It's hard to say uh, <clears throat> because it's all I right. knew at the time. Uh, I certainly had uh, a a lot of uh, conflict with religion one way or another, you mm -hmm. know, being raised in a pretty fundamentalist household. Good. I started calling myself uh, an atheist when I was a senior in high school uh, and uh, mm -hmm. pretty much stayed that way for the <clears throat> next decade until... I guess the early 90s at the same time I was reading up Russell Kirk and all that kind of thing. I also started flirting with uh, conservative Catholicism for several years, but I never embraced it, and I wound up drifting back into agnosticism. Mm. So when you like came out as like an atheist, was that like a big deal where you were from? Oh, I didn't come out. No way. Oh, uh, really? No, I that would have made things a lot worse at home. But uh, so I, you were I kind of like believing. Someone, you kind of like internally were doing all this radical stuff, all this radical thought. But in terms of like expressing it to like your family or like your neighborhood or communities, was that a big aspect of it? Like, were you um, going out of your way to be the guy in the corner to try to get people to think about stuff? Uh, other than writing uh, an occasional inflammatory letter to the editor, no. Uh, <laughs> I And, you know, there would just be political bull sessions uh, with at family get-togethers and, and that sort of thing. But other than that, other than that, no, I've never 
been much of a, a joiner or a, a public speaker, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm not the most persuasive person in the world, so. I don't know how you say that. I think you're well, I mean, in personal persuasive. conversations or uh, activist-type uh, situations. Wow. All right. Uh, well, after your first book, it got recognized some by academia. Uh, you know, the Journal of Libertarian Studies did a symposium on it. I was mm-hmm. curious how that came about. <clears throat> well, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I think it was probably because of my participation in uh, Konkin's Left Libertarian email discussion group. Uh, I met a lot of people there who were left Rothbardians or agorists like Roderick Long in particular, and he was editor of JLS and thought it would be, and he had been discussing, you know, similar lines of argument uh, from a, you know, more Rothbardian point of view for several years before that, and uh, he thought it would be an interesting thing to do, I guess. He contacted me and uh, asked me if I'd be interested. Of course, I said, yeah, and that that probably did uh, more than anything to uh, help me take off in developing an audience. That and Sheldon Richman... uh, started uh, printing articles of, of mine in uh, The Freeman in 2007. And uh, in the early 2000s, Sean Gabb invited me to write papers for the uh, Libertarian Alliance as well. All right. Well, with, um, with Roderick Long... Uh, Seems like, like you said, like he's like a left Rothbardian, and it seems like a lot of his thought. I've read only a couple of his things, but it seems like he almost blurs the line between what both of you guys do between the left and the right. Like there kind of is almost like a, a continuum between left Rothbard and mutualism. What 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 would you say to that? Mm. Uh, when I when I uh, when I called myself uh, an individualist anarchist, I uh, took a lot of uh, arguments from Rothbard, and I took a lot of arguments from the Marxists, uh, and incorporated them into my own fusion. So. Um, I suspect, you know, there's a a possible continuum between uh, some kinds of mutualists and some kinds of left Rothbardians, you know, where they would overlap in a Venn diagram. But uh, right. other than that, I can't say. Uh, I do know that Rothbard, I mean, I, I know that uh, Roderick Long... Uh, has made a lot of uh, left-wing critiques of existing corporate capitalism based on uh, the idea of the state propping up big business and promoting the interests of landlords and employers and so on. And I I was probably influenced by those at some point. Yeah. Have you heard of, like, horseshoe theory? That instead of the political political spectrum being like a straight line, it's more bent and towards the ends of the radical side, it's almost they almost join each other. I've heard that mainly from uh center left types, uh really? you know, still with hers and uh resistance liberals and people like that, uh, who use it to criticize anyone to the left of the DNC, to be honest, but yeah, I, I mean, I I had casually encountered it before that. Um, I'm not sure what how do much you think credence. about it. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm okay. not sure how much credence to uh, attach to it. Uh, I mean, I, I'm 
I think there is some uh, mirror imaging between uh, left and right yeah. forms of totalitarianism, just, you know, organizationally, mm-hmm. but I don't, I'm pretty skeptical as to how much that is a, a function of uh, how far to the opposite ends of the political spectrum they are as such. Uh, I think they just, uh, it's a, more than anything a function of uh, authoritarianism and the fact that they anchor uh, opposing ends of the spectrum is more or less fortuitous, especially considering that the most uh, totalitarian strands of Marxism consider people like Rosa Luxemburg to be further to their left. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well, well I mean, that's all I've got to say on it, really. Um <laughs> uh- and so, in switching subjects, you've done a lot of work with Center for Stateless Society. <clears throat> I was curious how that relationship started. Uh, pretty much from the same uh, the same basis as uh, you know my the rest of my contacts with uh, Roderick Long and uh, other left Rothbardians from Konkin's group. Uh, I was well acquainted with quite a few of those people. I talked to them a lot on his email list. And as far back as 2004, I think I got, uh, I was contacted by the guy who originally started it up, Brad Spangler, uh, which, you know, I have very mixed memories of, uh, considering, uh, you know, some pretty awful things he confessed to and the scandals surrounding that. But, I mean, to be honest, to be truthful, he's the first person who approached me. Uh, and then, again, uh, at the end of 2008, uh, I got a, you know, four years later, I got a follow-up saying we got our hands on some money. Would you... Uh, what, what what do you think would be a fair price for writing research papers and commentary and so forth? And uh, uh, Brad offered to uh, pay for a research paper and one commentary in hopes that uh, they would get further donations in the future and I could do it again. Um, and later in the spring, they started getting larger, regular contributions, and I came on writing uh, quarterly research papers and uh, weekly comment- uh, commentaries. Yeah, you have a and I've been writing for them ever since. Yeah. I mean, do you ever think about doing, like, a instead of a book, Carson style, you know, with all those commentaries you have? I mean, there has to be like several hundred. Um, I've I've thought of, of uh, doing uh, collections of them. Um, you know, on a, a few major themes, a lot, a lot of them are pretty forgettable. Uh, but there's some I'm pretty proud of. I'd probably want to polish them up to uh, some extent. You know, with acknowledgments that they're not in there original form um i've done some research papers for c4ss that fit together uh into into some common themes uh, especially the appreciations i did on individual thinkers in the anarchists without adjectives series i i might uh, compile into a collection all right um and as we kind of mentioned earlier about common pool of resources and common based peer production, I mean, within academia, that's becoming like a hot topic. And you and others at C4SS have kind of started writing about these topics. How did you and others get interested in Ostrom's work? Well, uh, the first, first encounter I had with that whole 
general approach, uh, I think it would have probably have been in 2005 or so that Michelle Bowens of the Foundation for Peer-to-Peer Alternatives contacted me. I'm not sure how he came a- across my work, but he introduced me to the whole I- idea of uh, common space peer production uh, and the the importance of uh, open source software uh and that led me on to uh some of his his connections with the open source manufacturing uh micro manufacturing movements and so forth uh before before I met him you know I had a theoretical opposition to copyrights and patents but uh I really didn't have any special interests in anything high-tech. If anything, I probably still had some residual primitivist uh, sympathies at a gut level from reading Kirkpatrick's sale and uh, getting in touch with Michelle brought me into contact with a whole different world uh of you know high techs post scarcity economics and uh yeah. you're I think, pretty uh, I don't know I got more interested okay. in Ostrom after uh I I uh was contacted by Keith Taylor who's uh a scholar in her thought uh and does a lot of uh, academic and political work with the uh, rural electric cooperative movement. Oh, yeah. I can't really uh I I vaguely remember uh hearing about her on the radio when she won the Nobel Prize and right and th- and, and being a- attracted th- to the idea that someone out there was promoting a third alternative to both State bureaucracy and the and the cash nexus, and I guess I gradually became more aware of her uh, after that. It probably wasn't too much longer after that that Keith uh, Taylor contacted me, and I finally uh, got interested enough to read several of her books and write a paper about her in 2013. And then I started seeing more and more stuff uh, at the P2P Foundation blog and similar venues tying uh, commons ideas and peer production together. And then, you know, after M15, the whole municipal a uh, new municipal municipalist movement took off in Spain and uh, I became really attracted to that. Hmm. It's fascinating. Um so uh in your work uh the emergence of non state spaces uh which have low overhead and in informal and household economies uh yeah, that's a big topic that you write about. Um uh, over the last decade or so what are some important developments you've seen in this arena? I mean, you have talked some about, you know, peer to peer and um uh well, uh, it just generally speaking, I guess the continued uh, improvements in efficiency and cheapening of tabletop open source tabletop Manufacturing technology, uh, groups like open source ecology that prototype actual uh, machines, uh, production machines, uh, the, mm-hmm. the growth of the maker movement, um, and uh, theoretically, uh, I read... Uh, Negri and Hart's books, uh, Multitude and, and Commonwealth, I guess, in, uh, it would have been around 2013, and the whole autonomous idea of the social 
Factory and Exodus uh, tied in with that for me. Uh, hmm. And more recently, you know, reading about the municipalist movements and uh, uh, how they're intersecting with the maker movement and commons-based production. All right. And with your book, Exodus, um, what, what on, is on, major... sorry, um, Corey Doctorow's uh, novel, Makers, had a really big effect on me because it reinforced uh, – and it it was part of the inspiration for my, writing my book, uh, uh, Homebrew Industrial Revolution, Revolution a couple of years later. But it reinforced the whole idea um, that micro manufacturing and direct production for use in the commons were were something that would be promoted or, or furthered by economic crisis that uh, mm -hmm. the their contribution to as, as, as an actual necessity for for survival for unemployed and underemployed people would be sort of the killer app that caused them to take off and promoted an actual tipping point uh, that's uh, an idea that uh, dr. O's book really helped to crystallize for me is there a timeline to that book? Like, how long into the future do you think until the, this tipping point comes? In the in the uh, in the novel uh, makers, um, uh, yeah, I don't think it it was ever explicit on uh, exactly when it was supposed to be, but it was written in two thousand and eight, and I got the the sense that it was set in the late teens. Uh, you know, sort of a near to intermediate future thing, pretty heavily inspired by uh, the Great Recession. Mm. And uh, you're writing a book now called Exodus. Uh, what is uh, the main theme in your book? Well, the main main theme is the overall uh, transition um, in ideology from uh, from uh, left-wing groups focused on achieving uh, post-capitalist society through insurrection, excuse me, insurrectionary rupture uh, and organizational models based on mass and hierarchy and so forth, uh, old left models, in other words, uh, based either on Vanguard parties or large parliamentary parties like Labour in the UK or uh, the AFL-CIO and uh, large-scale industrial unionism in the United States or even uh, the old the uh, narco-syndicalist movements right. of the old left that were focused on general strikes and seizure of the means of production. Uh, its uh, theme is is the transition from that to newer models based on gradualism, uh, secession from the existing society, building counter institutions, and so on. Uh, was heavily influenced again by Negri and Hart's writing on the social factory and uh, the idea that. We're already in possession of the means of production in our social relationships and uh, the small-scale production technologies that are available to us. We need to just take them and cut the capitalists loose from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, you're, you are basically reviving, I mean, that's the name of the book, you know, Proudhon's argument for gradualism. My understanding is that, like, Bakunin kind of was the first one to kind of disregard Proudhon's gradualist model and start to be like, you know, we need to have it now, you know, and unions and, I don't know, and Tucker seems to have been the main one to have taken Proudhon's gradualism. Is that correct? 
Uh, I'm kind of fuzzy uh, on that, but uh, on just yeah. the history of it. But uh, yeah, I would say uh, Bakunin was mm-hmm. very much uh, into uh, the idea of uh, conspiratorial revolutionary organizations and uh, mass insurrections uh, without having really anything in the way of uh an alternative social model in the in the making before the revolutionary rupture the idea that everything would just spontaneously grow out of revolutionary violence uh and he was is as best I can remember, he didn't have any emphasis at all on any organizational or cultural trends within the existing society that prefigure anarchism. Everything was just supposed to come out of the crucible of revolution. And I think he was uh, pretty heavily influenced uh, by Blanqui's ideas on conspiratorial, uh, re- revolutionary organization uh, coming out of uh, the period after the revolutions of 1848. Hmm. Hey, can I ask you one really quick question? Because I, it seems like you have read both of them. So, you know, Proudhon famously wrote, you know, uh, uh, Philosophy of Poverty, and then Marx wrote back the Poverty of Philosophy. Uh, those books are kind of like – especially Marx's version, is kind of dense and complex and kind of hard to understand. Uh, in your interpretation, how did you understand the arguments between them? Because I'm kind of uh, – I know you've written about it, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's been a long time, though. I mean, uh, the main place I wrote about that was in uh, Mutual's Political Economy, and that's been a long time. All right. But um, I recently uh, reread the material on on money in uh, the Grundrisse, and I get the uh, I get the impression that you know uh, while Proudhon himself uh, was pretty vague on uh, how things would actually work, and I don't you know attach a whole lot of credence to it uh, the orthodox Marxists uh, also underestimate the extent to which the availability of credit and the form it takes actually influence the bargaining power of the working class so alright All right. Uh, Kevin I just wanted to ask you one more question uh, so it's just you know you've read all throughout the political spectrum and you're writing constantly I just want to know, what is your motivation? Because you seem to be extremely motivated. Where does that come from? Uh, <clears throat> I just like uh, putting ideas together uh, into frameworks. Uh, I don't know if you you would attach uh, any uh, credibility to the Myers-Briggs uh personality classifications, and I'm not sure how much I do myself uh, anymore, but uh, one thing that <clears throat> really did stick with me, uh, I usually test out as an INTP, and that <laughs> NT combination uh, is... Uh, something shared uh, historically by a lot of system builders uh, or dialectical thinkers who see individual uh, entities not so much uh, atomistically or, you know, defined uh, in Aristotelian form by genus difference and, and all that, but in terms of their relationship to a changing whole. And uh, 
that's really that's really you know in real life the way my mind works. I like to build systems out of things. I like to extrapolate lines between data points uh, and flesh them out into frameworks. Uh, I like to take lots and lots of bits and pieces that I encounter in different ideologies and say, well, that that really fits in here and that fits in in there. Um, and what, I, what I like your, to share work, that. Yeah. What's your work process like, real quick? Like, Do you have like a whiteboard that you keep ideas on or are you just writing things down on your computer? Or how I, do you uh, organize your thoughts? I generally uh, keep... Uh, a number of uh, text files uh, on my hard drive uh, that are just in process of of drafting. You know, I might start out uh, once the idea of a book crystallizes in my head just with a very uh, rough outline of, you know, just three major points and create three uh, chapter files for those and start... Uh, transcribing notes into those as I read and then constantly cutting and pasting and rearranging within the files as they become longer and more elaborate and uh I think I think with Exodus I just started out with uh, three chapters uh and it's currently up to something like seven or eight because I've uh, continued to subdivide them. Uh, I keep a file of of uh, further reading lists uh, and work my way through that and take notes. And some of your books are like textbooks, you know? I mean, just a lot of material you've written over time. Uh, well, I used to, before, uh, I think the first book I uh, wrote primarily um, on the computer instead of typing it in, typing uh, the notes in afterwards was uh, desktop regulatory state. Before that, I I used to have these giant boxes of uh, five by eight index cards that I would shuffle around and rearrange uh, as I changed my outline. And then finally... Uh, Wow. Type the draft in when I was That's ready to finish the thing. Yeah, now now I just I just type stuff in continuously and constantly uh, revise the draft. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. I really appreciate your time. All right. Well, I uh, appreciate you inter- interviewing me. I think this is the first uh, interview I've ever done where I just uh, rambled on entirely about my own history. Yeah, you have a fascinating so that's always background. always fun. Oh, well, thank you, and thanks again for yeah. inviting me. Yeah.